Welcome to Reframed, a podcast created to educate, encourage, and inspire parents and professionals. The Gladney Center for Adoption staff know parenting a child that has a history of loss, abuse, neglect, or trauma requires parenting skills and insight to be reframed in order to create a loving and caring environment. Reframed host Emily Moorhead and guests strive to make an impact on our world through topics that are important to you, your family, and our communities. And now, here's your host, Emily Moorhead. Hi, I'm Emily Moorhead, and I'm Gladney's Research and Curriculum Supervisor. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas, and I'm joined today with my colleague, Lindsay Garrett, who is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Texas, and Rhonda Rorta, who has a master's degree. She is joining us today to talk about transracial adoption. Rhonda Rorta is a profound influence in the field with talking about transracial adoption with siblings, with adoptees, and with adoptive parents. She has written four books about transracial adoption, all which will be available in your show notes today. Rhonda has joined us to train our families and to have an important conversation with us today, and we're so excited for this. Lindsay, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about you. You haven't joined us before on Reframed. Yes, so um, I am a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I've worked at Gladney for about seven years, and I currently work in our post-adoption department. So I work with families who have adopted children from foster care, helping them navigate that journey as parents. Yeah, very good. And so this topic is very dear to you personally and professionally, and so I thought you would be a great partner in this conversation today. So thank you for joining us. Rhonda, thank you for coming to us today. It's a pleasure. So you are an adoptee and a transracial family. I wonder um, what it was like for you to have so many different identities. Can you share with me more about that? Yeah, I I think that um, being adopted um, into a white Dutch uh, family um, made me really question who I am. And my struggle was always how do I honor my family and also find out who I am in my culture? So um, it has been a journey. A lot of times I have fallen down um, and I try to get back up, always trying to um, embrace all of who I am. And that's, that's a balance. How do you reconcile having so many different experiences with identity? I mean, is that an evolving process or is that a... I've gotten to this point and I'm able to kind of move through it. What is that like? I think it's evolving. Um, You know, for me, I struggled with just looking different than my family early on as a child. Um, Then I struggled with um, how do I maintain my hair Mm -hmm. because the the, um, texture and how you care about it was different than how my white uh, siblings cared for their hair and my parents. Um, then I think it was, how do I deal with the comments from people on the playground and, you know, later on people on the street or in school or, you know, in the, in the stores? Um, it just keeps on evolving, um, but always wanting to find out who I am, which leads me to you know, connecting with my birth community of origin and birth relatives. Yeah, so it sounds like the, even as developmental ages, it led you to different milestones in that identity formation and reconciliation with that. I think even as a black woman in American culture today, I mean, there's probably a lot of identity integration that goes on and a lot of kind of processing who am I in this world or in this situation. What is that like for you? It can be challenging because, again, it's, it's, it's trying to know that you matter and that you're worthy. Mm-hmm. And that, that is embracing my wide nose. It's embracing my texture of my hair and, 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 and how I look. But it's also connecting me to the African-American narrative, which is uh, very diverse but has a common thread um, given the history in America. Um, and so that takes courage yeah. to, um, embrace that. Um, yeah. 
And then as a black professional, that's another level where you try to embrace who you are, but you also recognize how you may be perceived and mm -hmm. navigating those two. I was watching Sesame Street the other day with my little sure. my little boy. It's great. It's the best show. Um, if you have to watch kids television, that's yeah. the one. And I wrote a blog about it for Gladney because there was this episode um, of this little girl and her hair wouldn't fit in the same hairstyle that her white friend had. And she had puffs, but her white friend couldn't have those. Anyways, an adoptive father wrote this great song and it's like, I love my hair. And it's beautiful and it was so catchy and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And I just thought, man, our television is talking about this and our television is teaching these little girls and boys to embrace what looks different about them, which might not match what their friend looks like. What guidance do you give to parents and how to help their child embrace that identity as they age, you know, across lifespan? I think first we need to see our children. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to understand with transracial adoption, we have traditionally looked at love is enough mm -hmm. and that we see you just like we see ourselves. And I think that doesn't go far enough. Love and care is absolutely critical. But when we pretend that our child is just like us and not who they are. Sure. We dismiss their heritage. We dismiss their difference. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't embrace it and incorporate that within our family. So mm -hmm. I think that um, we just need to do a good job seeing them and celebrating who they are, the talents they bring into the family, and even working with the challenges that they may have. Yeah. We need to see them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I hear you saying that if your child comes home and something has been hard or they were called a bad name or something was on the TV that felt scary to them, mm -hmm. that you're not dismissing it, that you're acknowledging it and you're meeting them where they're at, no matter where they're at in that, and that that might be uncomfortable for you know, parents of a different cultural background than their child. I mean, you might really have to lean into some harm narratives, you know, different resources than maybe that you had. Um, so, I mean, I love that. Just see them. And that sounds so easy, but you and I and, and Lindsay all could agree that that's complex and that's right. difficult. Right. Can you tell us about a time when you felt like your parents did that well for you? Ooh, I love that. Yes. Um, you know, I think... I would say when my parents moved from East Palmyra, which was a predominantly New York, it was a predominantly white community, mm -hmm. and made the decision to go to wa live in Washington, D.C. area, mm -hmm. which was far more diverse, I think um, that was a point for me where I felt that they saw me. Mm -hmm. and, and not just saw me, but also saw value of having the entire family appreciate people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, that was very positive. I also think we'd spend a lot of time going to museums in Washington, D.C., and to go and see, um, you know, artifacts and, and, and art um, and um, paintings mm -hmm. by African-American people to see talent mm -hmm. from the black community was enormous for me. In your research, because I know that you've written several books, I mean, on this, but what have you seen that has been one of the or some of the most impactful things for adoptees in securing and feeling comfortable with their identity? I think to know first that they matter, that their story matters, is what starts building confidence, mm -hmm. that they are believed and heard. I also think when we see that our parents um, are educated on the issues of transracial adoption, mm -hmm. have tried to incorporate ways to embrace everyone in the family, mm -hmm. we begin to trust them more. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, just making sure that we see ourselves in positive light as well is so important. Absolutely. And I think for families, what do you think is helpful for them? I mean, they're embracing a whole new identity and a whole new family culture. And you talked a little bit in the training, and I kind of want to go back into that. You were talking about your whole family motto, culture, everything that you guys are is changing as a transracial adoptive family. Yeah. What does that look like? Well, so how I look at it is... 
um, we're just now focusing on white parents adopting kids of color. Yeah. So when white parents adopt kids of color, um, I think if you use that color blindness, which so many people use, it's mm -hmm. it's we see you like um, you are part of us. Sure. And in a sense, we are part of them, but we are different. Mm -hmm. And when parents um, uh, take those blinders off and recognize they are now blended, mm -hmm. That means that there has to be added responsibility, mm -hmm. added love, added care, added knowledge. All of that has to be um, increased substantially um, because now they have to create a family plan, or I would say I would recommend them, uh, these families, uh, building a family plan that embraces every member that incorporates culture. My father is from Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And so we learned about the way he grew up. We learned about his language mm -hmm. and his food and and we went to Netherlands. And so if that is important for him, mm -hmm. it's important for the children too, to be embraced. Sure. And so it looks different and also I think parents mm -hmm will find in the process that they may have to give up some of their white privilege. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, um, you know, if you're going to marry someone who comes from a different background than you do or a mm -hmm. different race, mm -hmm. you that mm -hmm. you become a blended family. You take on those traditions, you, you know, right. you marry those things during holidays and in right. your family. Um, and that's just expected. But for some reason, we don't have that same expectation when it's a child. No, and the, and the issue is that this is lifelong. Yeah. It is a lifelong journey. And there needs to be some commitments mm -hmm. Because as adoptees, we need to know someone has our back too. Sure. And so when there are things that are going on politically or even within our school structure or our work situation where we feel that there is injustice that has impacted us, that needs to be heard mm -hmm. within our families and not minimized. Absolutely. Or dismissed. Or yeah. dismissed, mm -hmm. exactly. How do we talk to our children about race and culture? I mean, especially I'm thinking about a white parent educating their child on something they may have not experienced. And so if you have a white mother who's trying to educate her black son on a, you know, on a racism or mm -hmm. what she's worried about for his safety, how does she do that without overgeneralizing her experience into his? Um, and how does she do that with grace, but also providing fear um, of what he does need to know. And so this is where preparation before that conversation takes place is so important. That mother should have already understood the tensions and the, the history of um, America mm -hmm. and its relation to African Americans yeah. in this country and understand that there was a time where people of color, particularly African Americans, were looked down as inferior. Mm -hmm. So when we look at racism, we're essentially looking at um, the, the, the maltreatment um, of human beings simply because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. And it's founded on economic and political and social um, foundations. And so having that context and having the context of the complexity of transracial adoption, mm -hmm. you can come to a discussion on race and um, discrimination in a more profound, um, comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. um, now, how do you explain that mm -hmm. as a white mother mm -hmm. to a child? Um, you know, for me, I mean, I like I like pies, for instance. I shouldn't be eating them, <laughs> but um, but you you look at you you say okay. As kids, why don't we all make a pie? And Johnny can make a pie, and Sally can make a pie together. Okay. And then we get we get all the ingredients put together, and it goes into the oven, and it comes out, and it just smells so amazing. And so everybody gets a fork because they get to have a piece of the pie. But we tell Sally, who may be African American, she may be um, a Korean. We tell her 
Sorry, Sally. I know you made, you helped make the pie, but you don't get a piece. Mm -hmm. And then we split out the rest of the pie for the other kids in the room, but Sally doesn't get one. You start feeling what it feels like mm -hmm. to be discriminated against. Sure. Mm -hmm. When you are so hungry and you can't wait to get that piece mm -hmm. of pie and you participated in making it, but you're considered, mm, you're not good enough, mm -hmm. so you don't get it. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with intellect or competence. Mm -hmm. It has simply to do with, oh, we, we're going to just discriminate against mm -hmm. you. Kids can feel what that must. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, what that experience Kids is. Kids understand injustice. I and mean, they, they understand really do. It. They understand it. And so then we teach them that when when kids are at the playground and somebody is being made fun of if they're wearing glasses or if they're in a wheelchair or if they have red hair or if they're African American, that when kids are being made fun of, we stand up mm -hmm. and we say that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And we care for the, the one that has been hurt. I love that. I think that's a I think that's a beautiful parenting lesson. It's teaching your child empathy because also like her piece of pie got taken and if you happily in, you know, engage in yours and she's mm -hmm. been, that's not okay either. Right. And so just teaching them to see and be observant. And especially if they all know why she didn't get that right. piece because she, we just don't like her. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and then if you add she's inferior, mm -hmm. now we're starting to feel what slavery or, Jim Crow, I mean, feels like when you are treated as inferior and take that to another level inhumane. Yeah. I love your work because I think that you you get to the root. And so even in your 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 books that you've written, you explain to, even to social workers like Lindsay and I, like, hey, here's like where the foundation is and here's what the concerns are and here's why it's your responsibility. And I love that that message... I think it's versatile and it's across parenting, it's across, you know, social work, it's across, I mean, everything, because that's what you have to understand. We have to understand how we got here. It's systemic. Yes, absolutely. So I, I appreciate that about your work so much because yeah. it's, it's taught me so much in that. Um, so Lindsay and I are both white mothers and we have white children. Um, and so one of the things that she and I both frequently talk about as moms together is how do we teach our children, one, like you said, to stand up and call things what they are, but also how do we raise them to understand racism when they may not experience it, but we want them to, to advocate and, and create change through their little lives. Allies for people yeah. of color. I think that kids need to see what their parents are modeling. Mm. So we need to see that, first of all, that in in your living rooms, mm -hmm. you have people that may look different in your living room, but yet share a common bond with you. Mm -hmm. We need to see how parents advocate when their child has been dismissed mm -hmm. um, and has, or when injustice has happened. Mm -hmm. And when we don't see our parents stand up for us, particularly as adoptees of color, mm -hmm we start losing trust yeah. and we don't feel that our parents are allies. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously, we don't learn the tools it takes to advocate for ourselves sure. because we begin dismissing ourselves. Sure. So when it comes to, I mean, this is a, this is a, um, I would say a national situation. Mm -hmm. We are all Americans and we come from many different backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and we need to start learning from each other, mm -hmm. hearing each other's stories, um, valuing each other. We need to, for those of us who have privilege mm -hmm. as white parents, white professionals, mm -hmm. we need to start seeing uh, those who have privilege to recognize mm -hmm. when uh, there is um, an injustices or when you don't see people in the higher mm -hmm. echelons of organizations that reflect the constituency in which you're serving. Mm -hmm. We need to see doors opened where 
equality can be restored. Mm -hmm. um, so we can rectify what happened in slav slavery and Jim Crow, which was Jim Crow was not that long ago. Absolutely. What about as social workers? I mean, Lindsay led a great discussion with our Gladney team today. I mean, how does a white social worker assess a family's appropriateness for transracial adoption? How is that done if, if the social worker hasn't experienced racism but is trying to educate a family who also may have not experienced racism? So herein lies the problem, yeah. modeling. Yeah. And so professionals should be building, if not have already built, but continue to build um, experience and expertise. And so um, it, I don't think anymore it's good enough to be um, a white social worker without experience in the communities in which these kids are coming from. Yeah. We have to have social workers that understand the complexities of um, and the depth of the environment mm -hmm. and the 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 people in the community, mm -hmm. so that we can add a nuanced approach to finding um, families that are in the best interest of the of the children. Absolutely, I love that, and I think that, I mean, I'll be honest. You know, from Lindsay and I's perspective, we were searching for someone to educate us for so long. There's just not the the work out there really that's as widely published or you know as popular. And so to find someone in the field like you that says, "Here's what you need to know," and here's all the different perspectives, it's been practice changing in our organization. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you found me. So so you have the skill set to to do that. I think that when you know that you have to do. It, you want to do what is right in the best interest of these kids. Yeah. If it's important enough to place these children, if we say as professionals, or as you say as professionals, mm -hmm. that it is important, then, 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 then you have to then be incredibly intentional yeah. to make sure that we do right by these children, mm -hmm. we do right by their birth family, mm -hmm. and we do right by the community of origin which we're, we're well, in which they're coming from. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and so um, I really think it's reading a lot on transracial adoption. We, there's a research list I gave earlier um, in the workout group where you can get a flavor of experiences, not just from African American, but from Native American, mm -hmm. Korean, Indian adoptees. But then it's reaching out to these communities. Mm -hmm. There are incredible resources in communities of color. There are people who are ready and wanting to um, uh, uh, contribute their time and their expertise, but there has to be a kind of respect mm -hmm. and there has to be a recognition mm -hmm. um, that it is a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. Absolutely. And Rhonda provided all of those resources, and so we have them in your show notes. We're so grateful for you, Rhonda, for the wealth of knowledge that you are. We'll put your website online so people can stay in touch with you. You have a professional Facebook page that we'll list as well um, because you're constantly you know, producing new work and having these important conversations across our nation, and we're so grateful. So that'll all be available for you. Thank you for tuning in today, and thank you both for, for allowing us to have this great conversation together. Thanks for listening to the Reframed Podcast. Be sure to visit GladneyUniversity.org to access the show notes and discover upcoming trainings at Gladney University. We'd love your feedback, so please head to iTunes and rate, review, and subscribe. Until next time.